This is Open to Hope Radio, featuring Dr. Gloria Horsley and her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley, coming to you on behalf of the Open to Hope Foundation, dedicated to those who are looking for hope after loss. Now, here's Dr. Gloria. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, good afternoon. I'm in California. It's morning here. Good morning, Mom. So we are going to talk about a really interesting topic today, which is post-traumatic stress uh, disorder and resilience. I'm very excited to have Dr. Southwick with us today because he will be talking about resilience. And what I like about him, Mom, we were saying before the show, is that he is talking about resilience and that it can be learned. And I think that is so important for so many out there that are that are really suffering right now after a loss. We want to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen M. Southwick. He's a professor of psychiatry at Yale Medical School and is a world expert on traumatic stress disorder and resilience. And he's the co-author of Resilience, the Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges. Well, welcome to our show, Dr. Southwick. Thank you. Great to have you on today. Now, I know that you say that some some of this optimism is inborn, uh, but it can be learned, right? Yes. There's no question that uh, some of optimism, of pessimism, our outlook um, is passed on in the genes, but not nearly as much as we might think. And with, as with all of the different uh, factors that are associated with resilience, which basically means bending but not breaking and bouncing back after adversity, um, all of the the different factors or coping mechanisms are amenable to learning. And that's true with outlook, positive, negative outlook as well. So, for example, Marty Seligman, a wonderful researcher from the University of Pennsylvania, has developed a therapy called Learned Optimism. And this is basically a cognitive behavioral approach that teaches you to pay attention to how you explain events in your life. And uh, although it's, it's, it's challenging, it takes a lot of work, you can improve, most people can improve their outlook if they follow uh, some fairly, uh, uh, some, some well-known principles. It's not easy, though. Right now, for our folks out there, um, they're not going to be able to quite get into that yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some tips and things that you've got that I'll talk a little bit about later. But first of all, I want to talk about the fact that the trauma that we have and that people have had out there is not only mental, it's physical. Oh, there's no question. Uh, There's a huge physical component. And that's this is one of the areas that's been... Uh, a subject of a tremendous amount of research in the last two decades. Um, when, as you said, you know, our stress response, cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline, these are all very helpful. They keep us alive and so forth. But there are times when our own stress response can be more damaging to us than the stressor itself. Um, and what I mean by that is that cortisol and adrenaline and so forth, if they are released unchecked for long, long, long periods of time, they can they can harm us physically, um, both our body and potentially parts of our brain. If I'm out there and I've had this trauma and I'm feeling like I am ramped up and it can go on for a year or even longer, what kind of things do you recommend? I know you have some things that people can do about connection and community. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how do I get myself calmed down and, and what did you see in the families that you worked with that became resilient? I think, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think of all the different factors that we talk about, I think that social connectedness, social support, uh, being with people who really love you and who you really love is absolutely critical. And one of the difficult parts is when when we become depressed or when we lose someone uh, who we're very close to, a child, for example, it's a, there, there's really nothing I can think of that's more painful. But we we tend to uh, worry that we're burdening others or we, we may become uh, more isolated, and that's not helpful at all. The power of a social network is extremely strong, not only psychologically, perhaps spiritually, but also biologically, so that when I am with people that I care about, when I'm helping people that I care about and they're helping me, I'm um, affecting various hormones and so forth, so forth in my body like oxytocin, which is, which is very much related to attachment and relationships. 
And one of the things that oxytocin does, for example, is it decreases the activity of my amygdala, which is the fear center and the center where I experience panicky and anxiety and sadness as well. And that literally being with people I care about can increase oxytocin and other chemicals as well to quiet me down from this very aroused, anxious state. And you're absolutely right, depression and grieving, there is a huge physical component to it, and it's very, very painful. So, so Dr. Southwick, Mom, I was going to ask one question to Dr. Southwick. What if I'm not physically seeing people, but I go onto Facebook and I get that connection with people? Will that do the same thing, connecting on the Internet, or do you need to be with somebody? Gee, you know, that's a great question. That's not been looked into in terms of oxytocin and so forth. I believe that any way that we can connect in a meaningful way is very important. Ideally, it would be in person, but we can't always do that. We learned a lot from the Special Forces, for example. We would often ask Special Forces instructors and soldiers, you are involved in some very dangerous, frightening things. You must be very brave. And it wasn't uncommon for them to say, no, no, it's not me, it's my squad. And what happens with a squad like this is they're very, very close. They cross-train. Everybody knows how to put an IV in, even though there's one medic. If someone in family member has a problem, it's not uncommon for numerous mm. Special Forces members and their families to go help that person. You have a bond for the rest of your life. And the point is, I'm, I'm mentioning this because these very brave individuals told us that, no, it's not me. It's, it's my group. So what we recommend now for everyone is form your own squad the best you can, even before things happen. Nurture that social network. One of the first things I do with patients now, which I didn't do in the past, I have them sketch out a, a diagram of the extent of their social network. Who is in their life? Who do they talk with? And so forth. And then I ask them to, to, um, to rate, if you will, the quality of those relationships. Who are the people who you could really count on and who you could really help as well? I can't tell you, and I think most people know this, but for someone who is grieving, it, it's very common to want to be by yourself and so forth, but I would strongly urge connecting and reaching out as much as possible. Yeah, Heidi, you were talking about... Um uh, we were talking earlier a little bit about some of your points, and how do you, you were talking about the fact that we got a dog, right? Absolutely, because, you know, when my brother died, people would see our family, and they would tend to, to look down and try to escape and run the other way. So my right. parents went and got two puppies, really cute Shih Tzus and Lassos, and everybody wanted to see the puppies. So it drew people towards the family, and they really needed those social connects. Mm-hmm. And Heidi and I also, uh, when we do presentations, we talk about um, some ways to get people to connect with you, don't we, Heidi? Do you want to talk about some of those? Well, we just talk about the research that's been done on, on hu- the importance of hugging or being uh-huh. being hugged for up to 20 seconds, of, you know, the importance of laughter. And this one I know that you're, you'll really resonate with, the importance of gratitude, just saying I'm yeah. grateful to have you in my life. I mean, it really right. changes the way that we feel fairly quickly. Social connection, again, it's not just our physical, our mental idea of connecting, but also physical. You know, you were saying about building social connections. You know, one of the problems of being bereaved is that some people can't handle it. Yeah. So the people that you thought were going to be there for you aren't. I noticed one of your things that you suggested is that you not only let people reach out to you, but you reach out to people. Yes, as much as you can. And I I do know that when we are uh, grieving and depressed and so forth, uh, it can be hard to do so. But that would be one of the very first things I would recommend is to to actively reach out. And and we we noticed this with, uh, with almost all of the resilient people that we interviewed, that they had learned how to actively themselves reach out uh, for support. I was actually going to ask you your thought about support groups with regard to grieving. My experience is that they're very important. Mm-hmm. I think for some people don't like them. Mm-hmm. I know that particularly bereaved parents groups where they have to speak out. And I think it's interesting, the idea of Facebook and we uh-huh. have a forum where people can write. Some people find writing a way to do sure. it. Now, what's your thought on the group thing, Heidi? I think groups are amazing. And I think that's what Compassionate Friends is about. But, you know, after 9-11, and I know, Dust, you've been very involved in 9-11 as well, we started a lot of groups for families. It was so powerful 
to have a shared experience with people. And everybody's grief journey is different, but there's also some similarity. It really normalized what people are going through, and it really yeah. gave them hope. And they felt like they weren't alone and that they weren't the only one that had ever gone through something like this. And sometimes people need to see that. Victor Frankl said in his big book, Man's Search for Meaning, grief needs to be a collective experience. Like you said on the show, we need to know that we are not alone in this and that we are going to survive and we're going to get through this and we're not going to have to do it alone. Very, very mm -hmm. powerful. And you said that in your book mm -hmm. with the uh, 10 resilience factors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will have, and it seems like it's oftentimes women who are very distressed because their husbands will not join a group. They think they should do that. So I get a little bit hesitant is about saying, all right, everybody out yeah. there, you know, this is the thing. You got to join a group because there are some people who maybe do not want to do that. And, you know, everybody grieves in their own way. And, and we certainly do respect that. There are many different aspects. Right. I say I am further down the process now. And you're telling me that I can't even build more resilience. Do you have just a couple of tips on how I can do that? You know, I'm ready to move on. And what can I do? I think one of the most important is to step back and think about what is meaningful in your life. What will be meaningful? What, what about your purpose in life? To focus on those, and those are, those are very difficult questions. And as Victor Frankl, I'm a huge Victor Frankl fan, as Victor Frankl said, that meaning is not really given to us. We extract meaning from life. It's, it's an active process where we really have to sit with quietly. No one else is going to tell us. Now, we may get advice from other people, but we really have to figure out what is meaningful for us. And after a tragedy like the loss of a loved one, what is meaningful to us may be quite different than it was before. And that's okay. That would be one of the most important things that I would recommend right away. There are all sorts of other kind of obvious things like exercise. There is an unbelievably fascinating literature on how exercise improves mood, decreases anxiety, improves the way your brain is functioning, is protective against stress. So there are all these things like sleep and nutrition and exercise, which mm -hmm. they're sort of just thrown around all the time. I mean, people, they're great recommendations, but in the past I used to think, yeah, yeah, I know that. Until I really started reading, getting in-depth into the neuroscience of exercise and how it affects the brain and mood and so forth. And it's pretty remarkable. And Dr. Southwick, how long, what's the minimum I can exercise and still get benefits a day? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not an exercise physiologist, but <laughs> as, I, you know, as, I, as I recall, I think the American something or other uh, recommends uh, three times a week. A certain, but, yeah, but it wasn't, I, that, I, it wasn't yeah. a huge amount, I remember. No, no, no. no. And it, somewhere. Right, and it can be, it can be walking. It, can be, yeah. it doesn't have to be lifting 300 pounds, you know. <laughs> Right. I'm so glad you brought that up because, as I said, we were talking about the fact that this is not only your stress and your loss is not only a mental experience, it's also a physical experience. So taking care of yourself is, is an important aspect. Mm -hmm. By the way, I did mention that, and I, I want to clear this up, I did mention that your own stress response, if you don't learn how to recover and, and bring it back down, can be harmful to you. That's true, but the vast majority of this is reversible. So you may find when people are depressed or when they have post-traumatic stress disorder or grieving, they may find they're just not thinking as clearly and so forth. And it turns out that various areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, may be being bombarded and they're just a little stressed themselves. And it turns out that a variety of activities, such as exercise, actually increase what are called neurotrophic factors in the brain, which repair neurons that have been stressed by stress. So what's happening in neuroscience these days is that scientists are beginning to understand why these activities that we all sort of know are helpful are so helpful. And one of the reasons we put quite a bit of science in the book was not so much for the science sake, but to demystify this process in some way so that when someone says, well, it's not all genetics, you can learn to be more resilient, etc. If you understand a little bit about the science, you realize, oh, it is true. There is neuroplasticity. By repeating various behaviors, I can actually change the structure and function of my brain. Now, how do people get your book? They could get it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, I think. We have a website, resilienceinus.com. It's just resilience, I-N-U-S, in one word, dot com. You know, however, I, I think probably Amazon's the way I do it, but yeah. Okay. And uh, and you can Google Stephen yes. M. Mm -hmm. Southwick. 
S O U T H W I C K because he has some wonderful YouTubes and radio shows and all sorts of wonderful things for you to access on there to learn more about resilience and, and dealing with those challenges in your life. So thank you so much for being on the show today. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Well, Heidi, a uh, great show. Uh, again, I just think it's so important to take a look at these physical aspects and resilience and all that, don't you? I absolutely do. This is a really important show. And I want to say that I know for some of you out there, this sounds like so much work and it sounds so difficult, but I want to challenge you with that statement. It's also a, a lot of work to stay in very negative places. It takes a lot of work. Absolutely. So it's a, you know, this is the first, this is the beginning of being able to shift some of that energy and shift the way you feel. And take care of yourself. And thanks for listening to the show today. And please visit us at Open to Hope. Dot com. We'd love to have you log into on our forums, read our articles, and listen to more shows. Thanks for listening today. You've been listening to Open to Hope Radio, hosted by Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley. Like today's edition, all of our past programs are available on demand at opentohope.com along with helpful articles, videos, resources, and links to help get you through the toughest time of your life. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Again, that's opentohope.com. Check it out today. Then be sure to stop by next Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time when we'll be posting another edition of Open to Hope Radio. Remember, others have been where you are. They made it through, and you can too, as long as you're open to hope.